That was one of the best intros I've had in a long time. So fantastic. So anyway, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited. Um, I'm kind of flattered. And quite frankly, I'm actually moved to be here. And I'll explain why. About 35 years ago, I was sitting in an auditorium very much like this one. It was my high school's seminar day. And I was sitting out just like you. At the time, perfectly content just to not be in my classes for the day. We had a long stream of speakers coming up, talking about all kinds of subjects, almost all I've forgotten about, except for one. Uh, I lived in New York, and we had someone who lived in our town who was an advertising executive. Think Mad Men. And he came, and he was showing his reel, which is the collection of all the TV commercials he'd done. And I sat there fascinated at this art form I was unfamiliar with. And during the Q&A, someone asked him, what's the best part about your job? And he said, he thought for a second, and then said, you know, I get paid to sit around all day coming up with crazy ideas, and then I get to see them come true. And the reason I'm kind of so moved to be here is I remember that day so clearly, because that really was the day that I realized what I wanted to do with my life. And so it's kind of cool to now, 35 plus years later, to have come full circle, and now I'm the guy on the stage telling you what I do, but no pressure. <laughs> so I've been incredibly lucky because for most of the 35 years since that day, I've gotten paid to come up with crazy ideas and make them happen. Most people talk about Netflix uh, as part of my background, but what they don't talk about is Netflix was actually my seventh startup. And since Netflix, I've spent years working with dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs who are all making their dreams become realities. And there's a lot I've learned there, but there's probably one thing that's probably the most important thing, which is that it's not that hard, and that anyone can do it. And more importantly, you guys can do it. And so if I have one thing I really want to talk about today, it's the key is, if you want to do it, just do it. Almost all the successful entrepreneurs that I know started off doing it in grade school. They did candy arbitrage, where they'd buy candy cheap, bring it to the playground, and sell it for more expensive. <laughs> they saw a hole, and they just went out and filled it. So people who are successful are not necessarily smarter than you, or better than you, or different than you. Some of the entrepreneurs I work with have double PhDs in math and computer science. Another entrepreneur I work with dropped out of high school to start a band. He has dreads down to his waist. And he's very successful. There aren't special skills. It's common sense. You can learn the process. But perhaps most importantly, you don't need to have a big idea. Everybody wants to be the next Facebook, but Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook because he wanted to meet girls. And Reed Hastings and I just wanted to find a better way to rent movies. Bill Gates just wants to eradicate malaria from the entire country, entire continent. But that might be a little bit too much for you guys. But you could start a club. You could have a hobby that, that becomes something more real. You can do a business in your dorm room. You don't need to end world hunger. But whatever the scale of your ambitions, whatever you're trying to accomplish, there is one skill you do need, and that's taking a chance and correspondingly being, uh, being um, willing to fail. So I'll do my quick poll here. Who here has gotten an F? <laughs> well done, well done. I've, uh, I've gotten two. And in some ways, it was a tremendously valuable thing for me because I realized the world didn't end. Oh, those are Fs on papers you guys are talking about. I got an F in a class. <laughs> I got two. Uh, and the world, didn't, the, world didn't, the world didn't end. And I often think that with all the pressure that you guys are under to do well, to get great GPAs, to get into the top schools, in some ways it wrings all of the innovation and all the risk taking out of us. As a society, we're so risk averse. All the playgrounds are dumbed down. People don't want to go out into the woods because they might get hurt. And people don't want to take risks on new ideas because they might get hurt. But being, taking a risk is built into every new venture. You have to try and be willing to fail, or you're never going to get any place. 
I consider it going into uncharted territory. It's what's terrifying, but what's fundamentally making companies, starting companies so incredibly exciting. So, do you guys have ideas for things you want to do? And if so, why not? Ideas are so easy to come by. All you have to do is look for pain. Look for things that suck. Look at things in your life and go, how could I make something better? If you have a hobby, how could I make that more fun? How could I make it cheaper? If you have a job, what part don't you like? How could you improve upon it? It does not need to be large scale. You have to train yourself to say, where are their problems? Where are their holes? And how can I fill these things? I'll give you an example. Um, I think it was Gary, perhaps, who talked about the paint and how you paint it on one color so you can see where the coverage is. I'm glad he is innovating on paint because, for example, as I was thinking for I how ideas are generated, I thought about painting because, for me, I hate painting. And painting is a terrible, terrible thing. And I'm surprised it hasn't been innovated on more. But it's a great exercise here to see how you can think about a common thing like painting and realize how much room there is for innovation. So to start, think about the can that paint comes in. Paint has come in that can since probably 1630. It has a top, which first of all, you need a screwdriver to take off. There is no other consumer product in the world that requires a screwdriver to remove. And then once you remove the top, it's covered with paint. So of course you put it down and then promptly step in it. <laughs> then you have to pour, you have to stir the paint. And is there any easy way to stir the paint? Of course not. So they give you a stick. And you stir the paint and you pull the stick out and it's covered with paint and there's nothing to do with it. So you try doing that scraping motion where you, you have to keep sticking it in again and again to get the paint off it until it goes on the ground and it too gets stepped in. Then you need to pour the paint into something and you're pouring out of a can with this strange lip on it. So of course the paint ends up running down the side of the can. It fills up that little groove that the lid sits in. There's more on that later. Now you have, a, you have this thing in a roller in a little tray and you're applying the paint and it's splattering every place. It's going on unevenly. I would have said you can't tell where you'd painted before, but I see that has been solved. Now finally you're finished. You're trying to clean up. You're trying to pull the roller off, this sodden roller. And of course, when you squeeze it, paint goes every place. It's a disaster. And then finally, the coup de grace is taking that lid and you put it back on the can. And of course, you can't use the screwdriver, so what do you need? You need a hammer. <laughs> and then of course, as you begin to hammer down the lid, what happens? The paint goes spraying all over the rug. So now, <laughs> those of us who have painted are very, very familiar with this, uh, this problem. So as I was going through that scenario, what was happening? Were you thinking, well, why doesn't someone just invent a lid which has a spout you can pour from? Why isn't the shape of the can making it easier to pour? Why isn't there a better way to get the roller off? Why isn't there a better way to clean up afterwards? Well, I hope you were thinking that way. Because if in two minutes of a scenario you can be saying, oh, there's all kinds of great ideas here, it's the exact same kind of thinking that you can be applying to everything else in your life. I'll give you one specific example from my own background, which is Netflix. And kind of contrary to popular myth, the idea for Netflix didn't just spring in some eureka moment into my head. We had to look for that idea. It was not easy to find. It was buried in a big pile of bad ideas. And we weren't looking for it in a video store. It actually came during a carpool. The company that Paul and I both worked for was called Pure Atria. And I had gotten there because a company I worked for before was acquired. And then as things happen in the big corporate evil world, Pure Atria was acquired by somebody else. And the good thing that happens sometimes is you get acquired and you're told, all right, we're not going to need you in the new company, but don't go anywhere. We're just going to pay you to go to a conference room and wait for six months. And I said, I'll use that time to start a company. And we began a process of looking for an idea. And my partner, Reed Hastings, would pick me up at my house and we'd drive to the office in Sunnyvale. And on that drive, we'd begin coming up and brainstorming ideas, one idea after another. And then during the day, in my big office with no one there, I'd research these ideas. And a lot of them would be OK, some not so OK. So the physicists in us know what a half-life is. Well, the half-life of an idea 
is about 24 hours. That means if you've got 16 good ideas, 24 hours later, eight of them are left. 24 hours left, four of them are left. One day later, you got two, and if you're lucky, at the end of that week, you have one good idea which might survive. So after months of this process, we'd finally found an idea that we liked. And that was this idea of maybe we could do a different way to rent videos. Then came, and I, this, this is what's apropos, is that, that moment that every entrepreneur has to face. I'd been researching this idea for months. I knew everything there was about video rental, about shipping, about DVDs, but I still had no clue whether this would work. There was no one who could tell me, oh yes, a video rental by mail of DVDs would work because it had never been done before. So you face that moment where every entrepreneur faces where you have to make a decision based on incomplete, inconclusive, or contradictory information. And I don't know, can I say this word? Can I? But you just have to F and do it. And we did. We stepped off that cliff. Uh, eight months later, we launched Netflix. And I'll tell one quick story in my couple minutes remaining, which is that it was that day before the launch, and we were all sitting around going, how many orders are we going to get? And we bet, and we said, maybe we'll get 20, maybe we'll get 30. And on day one, we would rigged up a little bell which would ring each time an order came in. And we turned the site on, and we all waited, and it went ding, and then we cheered. And then a few minutes later, it went ding. We cheered again. And it went ding, 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 ding. And then we cheered, and then the servers crashed. <laughs> and I spent my whole first day at Netflix not drinking champagne and uh, celebrating our success, but going up and down the aisles of Fry's supermarkets with a shopping cart, throwing in components, which we'd use that night to rebuild our servers. So I think I'm going to wind down with a quote from and I think his photo may have been up here earlier, a guy named Nolan Bushnell, who, to my generation, is known as the father of the video game industry. To your generation, unfortunately, he's going to be known as the father of Chuck E. Cheese. He invented the Chuck E. Cheese chain. And to parents everywhere, as the father of the headache. <laughs> but the reason I quote Nolan Bushnell is he said, everyone who's ever taken a shower has an idea. It's the people who get out of the shower towel off and do something about it, they're going to make something happen. So I will close by saying thanks to all of you. And since this is probably my last opportunity to address all the senior class, I will say thanks so much for letting me share your lives for the last four years. It's been really phenomenal getting to know so many of you. But what I do want you to do is get out there and try and change the world. But more importantly, I want you to get out there this Saturday at Carmel High School and root on the Pirates football team as they kick Carmel's ass. So, go Pirates!